While most states across Europe did embrace an absolutist ideology, not all did. And some, like England, protested absolutism in the mid-17th century, well before most criticisms of that ideology were in circulation. Even among those states who were flirting with constitutionalism, though, the Dutch Republic was different. Let's explore how. In 1516, the Netherlands, a group of Dutch provinces in Western Europe, fell into Spanish hands. Charles V had inherited the Netherlands as part of his Burgundian patrimony, and when he became the King of Spain, the Netherlands joined his Spanish Empire. When Charles then became the Holy Roman Emperor in 1519, the Netherlands became part of the largest empire in the world at that time. During the Reformation, many of those people living in the northern Dutch provinces converted to Calvinism, and they came to resent the imposition of Catholic Spanish power and its resultant taxation, and as well the Catholic Reformation, which seemed to want to obliterate Calvinism in all of the Spanish Empire. In the 1560s, the Dutch began resisting the Spanish presence in their lands. In response, Charles V's son and heir, Philip II, sent the Duke of Alva to the Netherlands with 10,000 troops in 1567. Tasked with bringing the territory into alignment with the rest of Spain, Alba ruthlessly imposed heavy taxes, interfered with Dutch self-government, and instituted the Council of Troubles, nicknamed the Council of Blood by the Dutch, which persecuted and executed troublesome Calvinists. Perhaps the most notable amongst horrific acts enacted upon the Netherlands was the Spanish Fury. On the night of the 4th of November, 1576, Spanish soldiers attacked and plundered the city of Antwerp, the main commercial rival to the Spanish port of Bilbao. While the Spanish Fury temporarily ended Antwerp's commercial preeminence, it also served as fodder for those Dutch who wanted to break away from the Spanish for good. In 1572, the rebellion became an insurrection under the leadership of Willem, anglicized as William, of Orange, a Protestant noble who, at one time, had been part of Charles V's imperial court. In fact, there was some tension between Philip II and Willem, as Charles had apparently preferred Willem's company to that of his own son. By the 1570s, the insurrection in the Netherlands mimicked the one that the Holy Roman Empire had faced from the Schmalkaldic League almost 50 years prior. When Catholic nobles in the southern Netherlands decided to stop fighting the Spanish and form the Union of Arras, their decision only further emboldened the northern, mostly Calvinist, Dutch. In 1579, the northern Dutch states formed the Union of Utrecht and, two years later, formally declared their independence from Spain as the Dutch United Provinces. Almost immediately, the Dutch United Provinces had support from other Protestant states. Most notably, in the mid-1580s, the English allied with the Dutch against the Spanish. When, in 1588, the English defeated the Great Spanish Armada, remember, that was mostly a weather-related phenomenon, Spain's ability to continue fighting against the Dutch, especially by sea, was destroyed. Between 1609 and 1621, a truce allowed both sides a respite. The fight would resume, however, when both the Dutch and the Spanish became involved in the Thirty Years' War on opposing sides. The end of that war ended the Dutch fight for independence, or the Eighty Years' War, as it's known. One of the treaties which comprises the Peace of Westphalia, the Peace of Munster, brought about, finally, the official recognition of Dutch independence. The Dutch Republic, made up of multiple provinces, had been organized with a federalist structure since the Union of Utrecht in 1579. The Republic's States General served as the legislative body to which the provinces sent representatives. Nobles received automatic representation and cities and towns elected representatives to this body, which remained continually in session. The States General had the power to represent the Republic in foreign affairs and to negotiate treaties. The presidency of the States General rotated weekly among the senior representatives from each province. In true Federalist fashion, though, individual provinces retained autonomy, provincial sovereignty, they each had their own leading nobles or citizens called regents, and they retained religious pluralism. That was unique enough in the 17th century. 
The decisions of the States General were administered by the Stadtholder, a title which translates to State Holder. This chief office holder was almost always a member of the powerful and noble House of Orange Nassau, and thus a direct descendant of the same Willem of Orange who had led the initial revolt against the Spanish. Willem's son and successor, Moritz, attempted to translate the office of Stadtholder into one more reflective of monarchical powers, but he was rebuffed by the individual provinces, particularly the wealthiest of them, Holland. And so it was that, at least initially, the Stadtholder had influence, but often not authority. He could not declare war, legislate, or even participate in the decision-making, the voting, within the states general. While Dutch citizens enjoyed some basic rights, provincial courts protected the citizens against arbitrary charges and seizures, for example, the Dutch Republic was more of an oligarchy in which wealthy, influential regent families monopolized political power both at the federal and provincial levels. But the Dutch Republic was stable, and as a result of the political stability, even before their official independence from Spain, the provinces were able to enjoy a remarkable time of growth and expansion in the late 16th and 17th centuries. This was called the Dutch Golden Age. In 1609, the Amsterdam Public Bank opened its doors and served as the main instrument of Dutch financial operations. Its principal function, to facilitate Amsterdam's foreign trade, encouraged the use of bills of exchange, an early European form of credit where merchants would sign a piece of paper specifying payment on a specific date on a loan of capital. This is kind of like the more modern check, which is now, of course, increasingly obsolete, but it revolutionized transactions at this time. The foundation of the Amsterdam Public Bank was, in part, an effect of the increasing success of the Dutch East India Company, which had been founded just seven years earlier in 1602. This company, known by its Dutch acronym VOC, had been established as a chartered company after the forced union of a variety of smaller companies focused on Indian Ocean Basin trade. The VOC was unique in that it was the first company in the world to sell shares in that company. It was the first publicly traded company ever. Anyone who could afford a share, or even part of a share in the company, could benefit from successful voyages. In 1621, the Dutch West India Company, the GWC, was founded to take advantage of Atlantic trade. These two companies, as well as the success of the Amsterdam Public Bank, increased the wealth of all of the citizens in the Dutch Republic. The Republic expanded its domestic productive capabilities as well, using dikes and canals to reclaim arable land for agriculture and commercial livestock production, and using windmill power to produce linen and Delft china. The Republic dramatically increased its population. By 1650, it numbered about 2 million people and was one of Europe's most densely populated states. Amsterdam, by this time London's main commercial rival, increased in population from about 50,000 in 1600 to 150,000 by 1650. By the 1630s, the Republic's 2,500 ships accounted for about half of Europe's sea trade. Such wealth made them the target of various states. France and England, in particular, targeted the Republic after 1650. But the Dutch Golden Age also included a flourishing of art not seen in Northern Europe since the Renaissance. Dutch artists elaborated on still life painting, pioneering several subtypes, including Bonitas paintings, in which the still life included items of Christian symbolism to highlight the impermanence of earthly life. Dutch artists also focused on historical painting, which included paintings of biblical scenes. The renowned artist Rembrandt produced historical paintings, including one of his most famous pieces seen here, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Dutch artists of the Golden Age also developed genre painting, pieces which depicted everyday, even mundane scenes. These artists were influenced by the work of Renaissance painter Peter Bruegel. Johannes Vermeer's The Geographer and Girl with Pearl Earring are examples of genre painting, as is Judith Leister's The Happy Couple. But, as previously mentioned, the Dutch Republic's commercial success bred political and economic competition. By the 1650s, England was under the control of Oliver Cromwell and the Puritan Commonwealth. 
Cromwell was determined to make England a world power in trade and expansion, and that meant adopting mercantilist ideas and dealing with the Dutch. To that end, he enacted the first Navigation Act in 1651, which allowed imports only if they were carried on English ships or if they came directly from the producers of those goods. This shift hit the Dutch especially hard, as the Dutch dominated world trade because they were middlemen. They didn't produce much of worth except for their ships, which traded items all around the world. Cromwell would also declare war on the Dutch, and the 17th century Anglo-Dutch wars would in fact continue even after Cromwell's death in 1658. The Third War didn't end until 1674. The Dutch lost the First War, but won the next two, despite the fact that they lost their primary North American colony, New Netherlands, to the English, who promptly renamed the colony New York after the naval commander, the Duke of York, who'd won the battle for the colony. So the Dutch Empire contracted as a result of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, even though they were able to, at that time, maintain their preeminency in trade. While the Dutch would get revenge, at least in the short term, against the English. In 1688, the English Parliament asked Mary Stuart and her husband, Willem of Orange, to take over the English throne from Mary's father, James II. Well, back in 1665, when the Dutch lost New Netherlands, they'd lost it to the Duke of York, that is, to the man who would become James II of England. Willem and his wife would rule England as William III and Mary II, and after Mary's death in 1694, William would rule on his own until his death, in 1702. So, for 14 years, England and the Dutch Republic were united under one leader who was, indisputably, more a monarch of the Dutch Republic than a stadtholder. When William III died childless in 1702, Mary's younger sister Anne became the Queen of England, while William's cousin John Willem Friso became the Prince of Orange and stadtholder of the Dutch Republic. He was not a monarch, so the constitutional organization of the Dutch Republic was safe. By the beginning of the 18th century, then, Europe had two constitutional states, England, constitutional monarchy, and the Dutch Republic, a constitutional confederacy. So the question was, with these two examples in place, what would the rest of Europe do now that we were seeing challenges to absolutism? <laughs>